Okay, well, uh, welcome to the first in our Retire Abroad Virtual Roadshow webinar series. Um, today, we aim to give you an overview of the what you need to consider as you plan your move abroad to retire. Um, uh, since Brexit, it has become a, a little more complicated, um, but it's still possible to retire abroad and enjoy the sunshine, the lifestyle, and generally a, a lower cost of living. Um, if you plan to spend part of your time in Europe, you'll be subject to the 90 and 180 day rule. Um, but if you plan to retire full time abroad, with the majority of you um, have indicated you do, um, you'll need to get a, a, a visa. And uh, there are various options, vary, and they vary country to country. So um, Spain has a higher income requirement for people retiring there, but even those retiring to live on lower incomes uh, can qualify for Portugal, France, and, and a number of other countries in Europe. So I am uh, Nigel Ayers, I run Expat Network. I've lived in Hong Kong, uh, Malaysia, and the US during my career, and have lived in um, Spain for the last uh, three and a half years. Um, sadly, not retired, uh, but uh, working. Um, we're joined by Joanna Alderton, who covers Spain, Tracy Bionetti, uh, covering France, and Lewis de Silva, who's covering Portugal. Uh, one or two of you indicated indicate, indicated an interest in other countries, um, Italy, Greece, Cyprus, Eastern Europe. Uh, we will not be covering those specifically today, but if you need any assistance or have any questions, just please email us at expats at expatnetwork.com and we'll put you in touch with someone who can help. Uh, before we start, just note that we're here to answer your questions. Um, and please use the button on your screen to submit any questions you have. We'll answer all that we can during the session, but any that we're not able to uh, cover at the time, we'll uh, answer by email afterwards. Um, so if you need any introductions to uh, the network, uh, our network of uh, service providers, just let us know, um, and we will put you in touch with them, including obviously the panelists today. Right, so if we could perhaps um, start by getting each of our panelists to tell us a little bit about themselves and the areas that they cover. Um, Joanne, if you could uh, unmute and uh, start it off. Of course I can. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. My name is Joanne Alderton, and this is my manager of the operations, Emma oh, yeah. Peter Jones. Um, I own a company called Alderton's based in Spain, and we deal with relocating and helping people relocate to this amazingly wonderful country. I have oodles of experience. I have lived in Cuba, Sri Lanka, Mexico, all over Spain in my career uh, within tourism over many, many years and settled here in this region of Spain 11 years ago where I set up my relocations agency. Um, that's Benny, by the way, saying hello to everybody <laughs> as well. Sorry. Um, yeah, that's that's basically us in a nutshell. We're here to help you. Uh, any questions with regards to Spain? We're all fully qualified in immigration, so uh, we're up to date on all of the um, what's the best way of describing this nuances that the Spanish immigration department can throw at you. So here to help. Hey, thanks, Joanne um, and Tracy. Perhaps you could uh, introduce yourself. Hi, yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Tracy Leonetti. And much like Joanne, I would imagine I am a relocation expert based in the south of France for the, for the past 30 years. So I came to France um, alone, younger, uh, in a car with a young baby, and it was a nightmare. And I decided it shouldn't be that complicated. But it actually can be. So I set up LBS, which is really a company aimed at help people, helping people from A to Z. So we do get involved in helping people find their dream homes. Um, but the main part of our business is to help people with the paperwork footprint. So it will be anything from immigration to healthcare to driving license, car registrations. And basically, we take people through the whole process from A to Z for the first year in France. Okay, thank you, Tracy. And uh, finally, Lewis, if uh, if we could uh, ask you to. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much, Nigel, for the invitation as well. And welcome, everyone. Um, my background is perhaps a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> so I was involved in the corporate world for, for many years. Um, I ran sort of technology and consulting companies all over the world. So lived in Brazil, lived in the US, um, worked out in, in Asia. Um, and then we kind of took a semi-early retirement, which didn't quite work out. And that uh, meant that we uh, 
uh, I, I set up uh, several uh, relocation and, and uh, real estate businesses in different countries. So I've lived in the Cape Verde Islands, uh, uh, in Portugal, in Spain, and 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 so on. Anyway, cut not the long story short, um, very similar to to Tracy and Joanne, we decided that the process of um, moving to a country like Portugal should be a lot uh, easier and 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 uh, quicker. Um, but what we did was basically slightly different. We we act more as a hub. So we have a lot of specialist partners dealing in areas such as car importation, pets, um, you know, the actual visa side and so on. We bring this all together. So we have some things we do ourselves and the others we work with partners in doing because we found that there's so many things that um, that need doing that it was almost impossible to be expert and, and have the time to do everything um, very well. So, so um, what we offer and the way we work as a model is very much a go-to partner um, in, in Portugal. So you can work through us to do anything from comparing different countries to finding a house, to settling in and getting an internet service, but we won't necessarily do everything ourselves. Um, and that's a bit of our um, our model. We work with around 30 nationalities of clients from all over the world, and we get inquiries from about 100 countries at last count. And I don't know, so very, very broad type of 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 uh, person looking to move to Southern Europe, really, as the ladies will attest to. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Liz. Um, we have um, the. <sighs> I think that one of the things that is consistent between the, th the three here, and one of the reasons they, that I, I chose them as partners, is that they do provide a, a service which is entirely to support the person moving. Whereas, you know, quite often you can end up working with this, uh, property agents and so on. And I've had personal experience of this where you feel they're working for you, but then you find they're actually working for the seller and so on. So, you know, there is a cost involved in that, but there is a benefit. There's also a one-stop shop uh, advantage. And, you know, I'm not wanting to sort of do their advertising for them, but, you know, that is, if you like, uh, the reason that that I choose to, uh, to work with these three particular individuals. Now, um, if we start off, I think perhaps give an idea of the sort of pros and cons, you know, the, the, the benefits, the uh, attractions of each of the countries. In the registration, you all indicated where you were looking to go. And it was interesting that um, although some clearly have a very clear idea of which country they want to go to, quite a large number of you actually have listed um, in some cases, virtually every country as an option, um, including um, some elsewhere. So um, I'd like to start off, perhaps, if we could just go one at a time and ask each of you to give an overview of um, the country and why you um, why people um, tend to choose it as a uh, as a destination for, for retirement. Uh, so, uh, Joanne, perhaps if you could start again. Yeah, so obviously, um... I cover Spain, which is Europe's largest destination for expats uh, who are retiring. Um, it's a very, very well documented country. If you're from the UK, then you'll see all of the TV programs about people ex uh, retiring to Spain, etc. Spain, you know, there's many things that people say about Spain that just attracts them. You have the culture, you have the food, and above all, you've got the weather. Um, we have the beautiful beaches, we have the outdoor lifestyle, um, and paella, paella, paella. What else is there to say? It's the most amazing dish on earth. Um, <laughs> but really, what Spain offers is an infrastructure and a shoulder to lean on just above that beautiful surface. Here you've got the beaches and the beautiful outdoor lifestyle, but just underneath, we have this most amazing infrastructure that you can rely on in case things get a little bit difficult. So Spain is a safety net for many people as well. It's a well-tried, a well-tested, and a very well-established location to retire to. Um, and it's not just about retiring because many people have retired over here and feel that they're losing their, or they've lost their grandchildren or they're, they're tied, you know. We have full families moving over now. I am one, my parents came with me and so they could be with the grandchildren. So we have full families. So you're thinking about retiring over here, talk to your children as well, because they may just want to come. And the lifestyle that you have over here now and the different requirements for visas, etc., have made it much, much more attainable post-Brexit. Okay, thank you. And 
one thing just to mention there is that um, we will have the individual country sessions. And I think at that point, we'll go in more detail into the different areas of Spain and so on yeah. and, and talk about each of the different ones of those. Um, uh, and also similarly for France and, uh, and Portugal. Um, so Tracy, if you'd uh, like to give your, if you like, pitch for, uh, for France. Gosh, my pitch for France. Well, first of all, I've been here for 30 years. And before I came here, I travelled extensively, and lived in many different countries. And yet France got me. So that's something to say about France. I've been here for 30 years. Um, but what I would like to spend just a couple of minutes on is, first of all, because a lot of people, when they work with us, the, one of the first questions is, where? Where in France? Um Obviously, before moving to France, the culture, the language, the, the weather, we can say the same as Joanne, of course, it, you know, these countries are all got fantastic weather, the quality of life, the outdoor life, which, you know, when you've got children is fantastic. The history, the language is, you know, is, is really, really um, romantic. Um, it's, it's the centre of Western Europe, so easy to travel. So it's a really good choice for location. And of course, world-class healthcare, which when you are retiring, that is also one of the things they're looking for. So uh, that's France generally. But when people come to us, they always ask us where in France, because, you know, it's a big country. So there's kind of two things to break down here. Obviously, first, it's access. So the first thing I say to my clients is, OK, let's take a look at, you know, what access means to you. You know, it could be, do you want to be within 30 minutes or an hour of international airport or a very big train station so you can get back to your family within the UK or travel to Europe? Because, of course, um, all, all the major points throughout Europe can be reached from France. So it's an amazing place to be able to also travel within Europe. So access from an international um, aspect is important. Access from a more local access as well, as in how much time do you want to drive? Uh, do you want to be able to drive to the supermarket or you're looking more to be having a local shop and coffee at, uh, you know, around the corner? So you're more of a village person or more of a town person. And then, of course, access also from a community aspect, you know, are you wanting to be too close to a, an expat community because you've left your family behind? Some people find it important to be surrounded by people of the same language. So firstly, that's the first thing we look at is the access from, you know, those three different points of view of access. And then, of course, it's taking a look really at what regions of France. And of course, there's something for everybody, you know, uh, from the northwest, which has got, you know, huge access to the northern uh, northern countries. So Scandinavia, and of course, very quick access back to the UK for family. Then, of course, as you go down the, the southwestern part of France, they've got the major, you know, rail network, although a few strikes now we're going to have to say we've got the TGV expansion so access to border with all of the gorgeous wines Let, let's face it we love the, the the wines in France as well you've got the south along the Mediterranean on the bottom there as well which is fantastic close to the Mediterranean beaches but also close to Barcelona and skiing in the Pyrenees so again a, a lovely part of France to 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 live and um you know, between Perpignan and Montpellier, it's got an amazing lifestyle. Trains to get you everywhere if you're a traveller. Southeast, of course, on the province and the Côte d'Azur, again, is beautiful, a little bit more expensive on the budget. Um, it's not renowned for being a, um, an easy accessible from a budget perspective, but, you know, it's got Nice. Um, it's got, you know, the most amazing uh, Côte d'Azur with the beaches and the city of Nice, which is, you know, now recognised as with UNESCO. And then you've got the eastern border of France with the Alps. You know, people actually love going skiing. Then um, the, the eastern border with access to the Alps and the, uh, and Lyon, which is, you know, is cold, but it's gorgeous. So, um, so as you can see, even, you know, central France has got everything to offer people. So, you know, when you're thinking of where you want to live in France, first think about what access means to you from an international and local and community aspect, and then start thinking about which part of the region of France meets your budget. So, of course, the south you go, the more expensive it becomes. Hope that helps. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, um, and um, perhaps um, we can finally, uh, with Lewis, um, covering Portugal. Um, sure. 
Yeah, so I think um, a lot, as as Tracy mentioned, um, a lot of the advantages, the obvious advantages, the ones you read about, the weather and whatever, are very similar across the Southern European um, um, countries. Specifically, when we talk to talk about Portugal, um, there are a few things that stand out, and at the moment. The ones that are standing out, I would say, in differentiating Portugal are, one, the ease of access for uh, residency. So the residency programs in Portugal are globally at the moment recognized as being the, the among the easiest and, and, and best, mainly because the thresholds are quite low. So the income thresholds required for retirees to settle in countries like Portugal are significantly lower than most other countries, including Spain and France. Um, but they come with additional benefits, such as the ability to work. Um, um, so those retirees who are doing part-time consultancy or doing that, that sort of thing, they can do that very freely. And in fact, in some of those activities, and without going into any tax advice, which we're not entitled to, to, to do, but, but um, there are additional tax programs which can be coupled to the residency program after residency has been granted, which actually can drive down the tax um, uh, levels and, the, and, and tax thresholds uh, for people. So the combination of the ease of access, and I'm talking ease of access in terms of actually going or getting to the country post-Brexit, because most of the audience in this webinar is from the UK, combined with some very advantageous tax regimes, as the moment has made Portugal you know, um, probably the standout choice for this sort of um, um, immigration. Um, the second thing is the is the friendliness with which the Portuguese government has always, and this is not a Brexit, pre and post Brexit thing, has always handled family regrouping. So the Portuguese government over many, many decades has always uh, emphasized the rights of families to group together. So if you get a main applicant applying for residency and being granted, usually this is very family friendly and the rest of the family, as long as they're sort of directly related, can join them without much ado. Of course, you still have uh, criteria, but you can do that. So families, a bit like Joanne was saying in terms of the lifestyle in Spain, but the actual procedure of families being accepted into Europe is 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 uh, into Portugal is is very strong. Um, the other thing that people quote, and I, I mean I'm I'm Portuguese and I'm you know sometimes a bit cantankerous, so you can't rely on me. But uh, but they say that the Portuguese people are very very friendly. And I, mean, and, and I must say to be fair that because they're a very um, sort of understated nation. Um, um, you you will notice the difference between sort of a French or a Spanish attitude and that of a Portuguese person. You know, they're, they're um, much more reserved, conservative, and so on. Um, and so you'll you'll notice that difference. I also wanted to pick out a, a few things where maybe it's not as good. Okay, so we don't want to just oversell. But we want to give you a good reality and a balanced situation. So Portugal's very well connected in terms of flights. Um, back into the UK and into Europe. So in Southern Europe, there are three airports, I always say this, there are three airports that, that concentrate the majority of summer flights uh, down into from Europe, Northern Europe, including the UK, uh, down in Southern Europe. So that's Alicante, Malaga and Faro, okay? You choose those three, you're getting a big chunk of the traffic that's coming from Northern Europe because people are are, 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 are traveling to, to, to those locations. That means that there are flights going back and they often uh, exist all year round with reduced frequency, but they do. So traveling from those three places that I've mentioned, two of which in Spain and one in Portugal, means that access is good. So air access is good, but for those of us who are trying to reduce that, Portugal is not as good in terms of train access, for example, back into Europe, for a simple reason that we're sitting on the edge there and Spain is close and France is even more close. And so therefore, if you're looking at sort of train travel, and this is like a, one of your big uh, things that you want to deal with, and when you know, travel through Europe on a train and those sort of train passes, then France is the most central place. Spain comes next and then Portugal is, is the least accessible because not only is it further, but its rail gauge is also um, um, slightly, uh, slightly different. 
And the final point that I would make is access to healthcare. It's interesting because France and Spain, even though all three countries rank very highly globally in terms of healthcare, sort of top 12, uh, but Spain and France rank really highly there, including um, Italy. The interesting thing is that in Portugal, even though we're slightly below and we're above the UK, so that's not, you know, so you're not getting any downgrade in terms of service, especially in the state that the NHS is in at the moment, um, you know, and there's a big debate about that. But the interesting thing is that access to that free healthcare in Portugal is actually free. So in some other countries, you might have something like a convenio and something else that you have to pay in certain situations. In Portugal, once you get residency, you can actually get access to the national health system free if you're a resident. So there is no limitation or boundary to doing that, even though some people then take out um, some private health insurance. So that's that's a bit of an overview and hopefully being a bit more balanced, a bit balanced there. Okay, very thanks, uh, Luz. Um, I, I think just as a sort of overview, one of the traditional views of um, Portugal has been the fact that with the uh, tax regime, as uh, Luz outlined, the non-habitual res residence scheme, which we'll go into in more detail in the Portugal sessions, um, the higher wealthy, uh, higher income people have tended to go to Portugal. Uh, but with the with Brexit, now it is an option for people on lower incomes as well because of the the higher things in in spain despite that spain we always find is a, a very highly you know the highest number of people wanting to go still want to go to spain uh, and provided you can meet the income requirements that is that is still a very attractive place to go but what we are seeing is a significant reduction of people in that lower income bracket being able to come uh, and in some cases people who are uh, you know have holiday homes there for instance are, are tending to to leave and so on um france i think is a is a very popular area um and has enormous differences you can go to normandy where it's a lovely place, but the weather's the same as England. Or, or you can go down the south and, and, and enjoy the sunshine and the southern lifestyle that you get in, in, in Spain and Portugal. So overall, you know, all three have their attractions. Um, there are it, there's Italy, Greece, Cyprus, um, Malta, which people go to, much lower in terms of numbers. Uh, and increasingly, um, Eastern Europe is being opened up where you can get very low cost accommodation and property and so on, but a much less developed expat community and so on. So, so those are your options. I think that you know many people, as I said earlier, have have put multiple countries, and there are all of those options available. So now, perhaps if we can move on and just look at some of the issues that you need to consider as you uh, plan your retirement. Um, the first, I guess, is um, is financing your life abroad um, and. The primary thing here, we will, we do have the session on financing um, property, uh, financing the um, your, your life as an expat this afternoon. Uh, we'll go into much more detail there. Uh, but you know, you've got to look at your pensions. What are the issues with the state pension? Uh, how do you get hold of your state pension? And that's all very straightforward. You just need to apply uh, and so on. But you have to go if you're abroad on to the international area. Um, and private pensions, there are a lot of issues around that. Um, so uh, the other thing, I guess, is around what does it cost? What's the cost of living? How does it compare? Um, and perhaps if we could just get a very brief overview of the sort of cost of living and how it compares there um, in terms of um, you know, France, Spain, Portugal compared to the UK. So Tracy, perhaps you could uh, lead off there. Well... You know, the cost of living in France uh, compared to the UK um, is actually it's cheaper to live in France by about 20% in France as a general. Of course, where the cost of living in each different area is slightly different. So as you said rightly, Nigel, if you live in, in the north of France to the south of France, the cost of, of cost of living is different. There's always that kind of north-south divide like you have in most countries. So you will find if you're living on the Côte d'Azur that you will pay more for your coffee than if you're living in Brittany. Um, on the other hand, as a general rule, you will find as the cost of living at the moment um, has risen for everybody in Europe, 
um, as it stands right now, it's, I, I was looking literally just last week at this, because I get this question for many of my clients coming, you know, how much money will they need to survive in France compared with the pensions in the UK? It's working out at the moment as a general basis, it's 24% cheaper to live in France than it is in the UK. Um, and your pensions uh, that people get from the UK are state pensions. If you, you know, transfer that into uh, euros is sufficient. Uh, to be able to come to France with certain criteria, of course, if you have a property that you've bought and you've got no mortgage, then most people live quite re relatively nicely on their private pensions and state pensions. Um, so I think I think it's really about. Um, I don't believe uh, with my clients and the way that our philosophy of looking at moving to a different country. I think you have to have to have to plan it very carefully. Work with the right people. But you have to also live your dream. If it's something you've wanted to do for so many years, especially if you get into the retirement age, then you need to really go for it. Because um, most of my clients, you know, they're often um, have been planning this for many, many years. And um, the cost of living changes each time as we're moving forward. So um, I don't think you should put off tomorrow what you can do today, so long as you plan ahead with the right people. And um, for France, it's certainly um, from a visa perspective can be a little bit more arduous than Portugal. In fact, uh, definitely is more arduous from a financial perspective. But the cost of living, um, I think, is on a par at least um, it's not more expensive the UK, especially for this kind of the northern part of France, where it is definitely cheaper. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just make one quick comment there. When I when I first moved to Hong Kong, uh, a friend said to me, "You will suffer value shock." So there are some things in Hong Kong that are massively more expensive than they are in the UK. And some things that are massively cheaper than they are in the UK. And don't spend your life translating back into sterling, but just accept that you're in a different country and that things cost a different amount. And overall, yeah, these countries are cheaper. So and I, I, and I, I think it's worth to mention now that when you move into any other country, I mean, whichever country... Uh, the listeners decide to move to it's it's a a whole different culture a whole different language a whole different way of life it's not just a financial move it's a whole uh move and that challenge with its positive challenges and negative challenges makes uh for a big package that you shouldn't just focus on one thing it's the whole the whole move across which is 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 really important to, to think about okay thank you um yes and and uh, uh, perhaps lewis if, if you could just give us a quick outline on on, on portugal and the sort of costs there how they compare yeah um head in my hands because with this inflationary cycle i mean <laughs> who can predict i mean i never thought i'd say this but um i actually found um oh, just this last month um fuel prices in Portugal were lower than the UK. Um, now, this has never happened because Portugal has one of the highest tax uh, burdens um, uh, per, per litre. Um, I think 65% of our, of our petrol price uh, is, is tax, uh, VAT and also, and, you know, fuel tax and whatever. But it was actually lower than the UK momentarily. Then it's around, you know, the the the, the UK then started dropping its its fuel prices uh, and passing on the uh, the uh, the, um, uh, the the benefits of a lower a crude oil price. And in fact, I even noticed a, a lot of people in coastal Portugal. Uh, when I say coastal, I mean not coastal, um, a, a border Portugal hop over to Spain to go and fill up um, in Spain and they stopped doing this in December for whatever because the, the the prices of diesel which is quite used in Portugal were lower than Spain so the point I'm trying to make first point I want to make is that the comments we were making maybe a year or two ago which are quite stable in this country offers this and is x percent below in the current inflationary times are very very difficult to, to it's difficult to comment on this because different items are moving at different prices so what I'm preferring to do these days is comment on a couple of basic items which are important for each person let me highlight portugal real estate has become a lot more expensive okay 
So accommodation in terms of rental, okay, there's a huge demand. We're getting so many people um, from all over the world uh, moving to Portugal that to find long-term rental accommodation in popular places, I don't mean in the inland Portugal, whatever, we're still very cheap, but in popular places has become a lot more expensive than, than, than it was. I'm not saying more expensive than the UK, but don't expect a massive saving if you want sort of quality accommodation there. Okay, that's the first point. And in some uh, cities like Lisbon, for example, or Porto, Lisbon more so, you know, the prices can be even, you know, as, as high as London, uh, in some areas of London. So it's, you know, Lisbon, as a, an, a sort of an example, has become in some areas as expensive as Paris, um, in some uh, arrondissement uh, or, or, or some or some neighborhoods, okay? It's not the general view, but a renting has become more expensive. And one of the reasons is because the program in Portugal is so flexible. You don't have to buy a house to move to Portugal. You can rent before you do so. So, you know, the, that's the reason why rents have become, and it's so difficult to get, find rentals because see, I mooted myself. The rental, the owners pay uh, more tax on long-term rentals than they do on short-term rentals. And so uh, people don't understand this. Okay. So um, the buying real estate, the other thing, which is, you know, you've got to live somewhere. So if you don't rent, you're buying. And if you don't own a house, a bit like Tracy said, if you own a house outright, that is great because you've sorted out one of the costs. You've taken out exchange rate out of that. You've taken out sort of a, um, a, a real estate fluctuation. But if you haven't and you need to buy a house, you need to think very carefully because prices have increased by about 100% in the last six, seven years um, uh, approximately. So more than most other European countries, although admittedly Portugal a bit like Spain suffered hugely after the 2008 2009 crisis okay so that's the thing other things that are cheap food is very cheap uh relatively speaking even though people are complaining about prices going up but to eat out or to cook in um it's still relatively inexpensive and the quality of the food is very is very good i always compare portugal to spain and i say the following in spain you get actually very cost-effective high-end uh, meals if you eat out. So if you're eating out in a fancy restaurant, Spain is good value for money. If you're eating out in a basic restaurant, Portugal's fantastic value for money. So that's where the differences are in, in the two countries. So you can eat out very simply, cheaply. And actually, just a little hint now, and um, then this applies back to you in the UK when you're listening and in the and in Portugal. Um, so we, we do this a lot because we do it as a family. We have children who are starting out in life and they're also looking at saving costs. There are two things that we do, and in the UK and in Portugal. The one is to do the milk run on shopping. And that is each shop will have different uh, discounts uh, on different days of the week. Some will be meat, some will be fish, some will be whatever. You know, Make sure you do your rounds in your local supermarket and buy different things from, from the different um, stores. Um, actually, the same thing happens in the UK. For those of you who shop at different places, Lidl will have the sort of 150 grocery thing, um, as they will have its best buy date, as will Tesco. So you can do those things in the UK. Um, but what we suggest in Portugal, and it, ha it exists in other countries as well, there's a, an app called Too Good To Go. I don't own any shares in the app, by the way. Um, uh, Too Good To Go. You should actually use that because um, bakery items, um, over uh, 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 extra meals that may become available, whatever, they're actually low cost meals, very good quality, and you can shop out. So, um, Expensive items in Portugal, I know I've been going on a little bit here, but um, electrical items, very expensive. Um, cars, hugely expensive. So if you move to Portugal, make sure you bring your favorite car with you. But if you're coming from the UK, beware, driving on the wrong side of the road. So overtaking is a hassle and taking a paper from the toll booth is just almost impossible unless you have a co-driver and you put your, your, your handbrake up. So there are some things that are going to be um, difficult, but be work out, uh, try and do a budget 
item by item, because as Nigel says, some items will be a lot more expensive, some will be a lot cheaper, and not everybody spends in the same way. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Lewis. And um, finally, um, uh, uh, Joanne, if you could uh, give us a flavour of the sort of issues in, in, in Spain. Well, yeah, it's pretty much like um, Tracy and Luis have said. There's, uh, there, there are many things. Overall, the cost of living in Spain is, is far lower than it is in the UK. Um, a couple of points um, with regards to food, yeah, food on a day-to-day -day basis is cheaper than the UK, but you do have to be careful. If you are moving to a big expat area and there's lots of imported goods, they are expensive, especially post-Brexit. So we do have overseas supermarkets here that you know, specialise in low pack butter and Morby's bread and things like that. You're going to pay a lot for those things. Like, on average, it's seven pounds for a tub of low pack, you know, uh, seven euros, sorry, for a tub of, of low pack and three euros for a loaf of bread. So 10 euros for bread and butter. But then if you go to the local Spanish supermarket, you're going to pay one euro 85. So, you know, they, there's a massive differences. It's about changing your lifestyle a little bit as well to settle in. But overall, some of the big payments that you make when you move to Spain are going to be things like the equivalent of the council tax, which is called IBI over here, and Basura, which is the rubbish collection tax, because they're two separate taxes that you pay. And they overall, to give you an idea, I live in a three bedroom villa with a pool. I pay 680 euros a year on my council tax and I pay 160 euros a year on the rubbish collection tax. Now, when you transplant those into council tax in the UK on maybe a three or four bed detached house, that's drastically different, no matter where you are within the UK. So those month by month payments on housing or things, um, you do save a lot. That said, Louise was absolutely correct when he was talking about the cost of real estate and the cost of um, uh, lettings or long-term lettings. They, to be quite honest, on the cost are like hen's teeth. A long-term letting these days is very, very difficult and has been, get, been getting more and more difficult over the past four or five years, but now we're in the pinnacle of it. And it really is difficult to find decent quality long-term letting at an affordable price. It is very expensive. Not only are we under an immense amount of pressure from people moving to this area to try and find long-term letting, but you're also up against tourism. And there is big profits to be made on holiday rentals. So people want to rent their houses out through those 11 weeks of the height of the summer over on the costas when the whole of Madrid moves down to the coast and the whole of Holland and the whole of Norway and the whole of Switzerland are all moving to the coast of Spain for a few weeks. People want that money. So it's very difficult to get a 12 month rental as well. And you'll quite often um, come across rentals over here, which will offer you a 10 month rental, but you have to move out between July and August. So whilst they're not 100% legal to have those contracts, they do happen and you will never change it because it just is the way that it is over here. So that's quite a difficult thing. I wrote down a few other little points when I was listening to the other guys as well. So just as today, uh, to give you an idea, a litre of unleaded petrol today on the petrol station next door to our office is €1.56. Um, so I'm not sure what that is in comparison to the UK, but one euro 56 today. Um, we have things like childcare, schooling and after school, which for retirees isn't very important. But if you're thinking about bringing your family as well, huge difference from the price in the UK and in the States, I know. Um, I'm the mother of two young children. I moved here when my children were one and two years old. Now, I had a very corporate job in the UK. Um, but I was paying £1,800 a month to have my children in childcare. And I was being charged £3 a minute if I was late to pick them up after six o'clock in the evening. It was absolutely extortionate. These days over here, I moved to Spain. My children, I paid €280 Euros a month. I could have, and that's for both children. And I could have them in from eight in the morning till six in the evening with food included. So it enabled me to start my business. So, you know, that type of thing is a massive saving. We also have after school clubs, which are heavily subsidized by the town councils here. My children in gymnastics, they pay 40 euros a month and they train three hours a night, four times a week. So it, there's, there's some amazing options. Sailing, they did sailing school, 70 euros a quarter. And that was for nine o'clock till one o'clock Saturdays and Sundays. So the prices on everyday living and, and a lifestyle over here, massively different. 
with regards to food again and going out the lifestyle is cafe culture here the lifestyle is being outside it is socializing and being on the the paseos and the the uh, promenades and the beaches or the town squares and the plazas and a lot of its focuses around the uh, lunchtime trade, sitting in the cafes and the bars. Here at the bar and cafe that's next door to our office, it's 11 euro 60 for a menu of a day. Now that is three course meal with wine included and coffee at the end of it as well. So 11 euro 60 isn't bad. And I can tell you the food is very, very good in that restaurant <laughs> or that bar. So yeah, all in all, there are some really good savings on everyday um, lifestyle choices uh, overall real estate can and has got a lot more expensive than it was has as has rentals but you are saving on the everyday lifestyle okay thank you thank you joan um just touching on the point you made there about property um you know one of the, the decisions people need to make is whether they want to rent or buy their property would live in um, we won't go into that now because we've got a session on, on property uh, tomorrow um, and uh, then I will obviously deal with that in the individual country sections as well. Uh, the other thing you need to decide is what you do with your UK property. Uh, and again, that's something that uh, you need to decide. There are financial um, implications sometimes of holding on, particularly at the inheritance stage where you will retain domicile I and mean, domicile is difficult enough to shake off, so to speak, in, in terms of... Um, uh, inheritance tax and so on, which uh, uh, somebody from Blevins Franks will explain in more detail in our section on the finances. But um, uh, UK property, obviously, there are various issues with that. Um, but perhaps if we just move on, we'll get onto some more of the technical issues around um, the immigration and so on shortly. But uh, before we get there, perhaps just a, a little tip, a few tips on on settling in, because I know that for many people, you know, you arrive in a new country. You know, it can be quite intimidating uh, if you've never been, you know, abroad before, other than your sort of one week or two week holiday. Um, and it's very different when you're there the whole year than it is when you're when you're there now. We we moved to uh, Spain. We took a little bit of time to settle in, and we moved to many countries. Um, and then we had the added complication that COVID turned up, so we couldn't actually go outside of our our front gate and so on. So it was very difficult to to mix in. Uh, some people want to live a life with the local community and feel that's the way they they want to live. Others want to make sure that they're surrounded by by other expats and and can uh, you know make contact with them. So perhaps uh, Tracy, could you give us uh, your tips on how to sort of settle in as as a newcomer to to France? Gosh, you know, and settling in is the big thing, isn't it? Because, of course, when you move into another country, you're first thinking about the big things like finding your property, will it be rental or buying? And, you know, even finding where that wants to be. People tend to really think about the big things first, but the settling in, nobody really tends to think about. And it kind of just happens to you. And sometimes it doesn't always happen in the best way. I know because my first year in France wasn't the best year I had. A, because I hadn't organised my paperwork. That's why it comes from experience, what I do. Um, but the settling in was really hard because you have this major culture change, although that's what you're coming for as well. I mean, a part of your dream is to learn a new language, is to, to have this cafe culture like Joanne was talking about, which is very similar in France. Everybody lives outdoors. Everybody has barbecues. Everybody's on the beach. It's a whole new way of life. And that settling in, although it's part of what you want to do, can, uh, can be um, kind of just thrown at you. So I think there's some really important tips that you can do to settle in. One is, again, going back to the first things at the beginning about access. Are you the type of person who wants to be surrounded by a local community of expats? Does that make you may feel more comfortable or not? Some people actually do, and some people actually want the opposite. So that will be part of the criteria for your search of where you want to be. Now, so that means when you first come into France, you, you know, take away all the paperwork side of it. For me, it's about, first of all, is reaching out within your local community. And if you're in a small village or in a large town, there are often local events. So starting to go to your local events, obviously language lessons are going to be key. And anybody who's moving into a, a, a foreign country should be learning the basics anyway. 
before they come over. But, you know, I did, for example, I had the best um, training course on laptops, on, on, you know, Word and things like that. I obviously had no problem with working on PCs, but I wanted to integrate into a French training class. So I went on a French uh, PC course and had the best time with like 15 people. I got so much language skills through that, met so many people. Um, so reach out to do a training course, join an association, get involved in the local village events, do exchange courses for languages. You know, for example, meet somebody in the supermarket and exchange a coffee, you know, in the local uh, coffee bar and do a bit of Spanish or a bit of French and English. Um, so I think that settling in period is really about the cultural settling in to really reach out within the local community of where you can get involved organize um, little aperos, as we call it in French, you know, a wine evening or a cheese and wine evening. That's what we tend to do. Uh, we even have a neighbours um, event once a year where all the neighbours get together if they don't know each other and all get together and have a drink and some nibbles. So it really is depending on, you know, which community you're in, but there always will be local events. Even the, the local church has, you know, events, where you can go and get involved with people either in the local language or in obviously your, your language if you join you know, an expat community. So that settling period can take about a year. I think you don't want to underestimate, despite the fact you're living your dream possibly, don't underestimate the settling can take about a year. And that's a year from a paperwork perspective, but also from a cultural and language and you know getting used to the area perspective as well. Um, as was touched on by both Joanna and Louise earlier, from a cost of living aspect, the, the outside arena is really important in France. And the good thing about France, if I can point out one good thing, although there, is, there are obviously some other negative things, but the positive thing is the government do tend to block prices. They do block the petrol prices and they give you money off. They do block the electricity prices. So that is where we come in a little bit easier on some of the other countries um so for the yes yeah, sorry to finish on the settling in do take that time to reach out to your local community and don't be scared you know enjoy the process i would say enjoy the process don't make it a this something i can't do i can't speak the language it's not about that it's about connecting it's about communicating and just getting involved of where you're living don't hide in your corner that's what i would say to you Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Tracy. Um, uh, Lewis, have you anything to add there in terms of uh, how to? Um, yes, actually, it's 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 interesting that uh, Tracy mentions the sort of falling into the thing because it often does happen. You spend so much time on the admin that you don't realize then you know um, how to go about starting to live uh, your life. But I had three points to make. Quick ones. Um, if you have family. Uh, the easiest way is via the children. I mean, this is the 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 obvious way. They will have um, friends. They will have play groups, depending on the age. They will have after activity, uh, after school activities. Accompany your children, and you will make the friendships, and the families will make um, uh, friendships. But mm, the audience of this uh, presentation probably are mostly pre-retirees or retirees, so that probably does not apply. And then I would say the number one way of doing this is via your hobbies okay so whatever hobbies you have this will be the route in and the, the ones that are common will be slightly different in different southern european countries but the ones that we have seen that be most successful at helping you maintain your hobby and meet people um are golf golf is a is a big one um, bowls is another one. So lawn bowling, as opposed to ten pin bowling, um, is 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 um, is is another one. Um, tennis, and in <clears throat> interestingly in Spain, because it grew in Spain and then sort of transferred over to Portugal, and it's the fastest growing sport in the world. Um, a thing called paddle. So it's very easy to pick up. So if you are rackets, uh, you know, badminton -y or tennis -y or whatever. Paddle is very easy to pick up. It's played with a partner, so there's always doubles. And in a small court, like combination of tennis and squash, um, and there are tons of clubs around, you know, Spain, Portugal in particular. I'm actually not quite sure if it's taken off in France, to be fair. Um, um, and it's something that doesn't really occur in the UK, strangely enough. 
Uh, it should, uh, you know, if David Lloyd is is listening to this webinar, I want to, you know, I want a commission on the idea, please. Um, so, so, um, but that's that's the sport, and it's easy to meet because it's sort of mini leagues um, and stuff uh, going on. The other thing that we see, not so much via English people, but the Americans are really hot on this, is meeting other people via Facebook groups. You know, so Facebooking other people and so on. Americans are just like, or um, if any Americans listening, you guys lead the world in terms of um, posting and communicating and sort of establishing relationships with other sort of Americans in a new country. So that works well. Um, if you are religious, and particularly if you're Protestant, um, then many of the churches have the 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 protestant service after the roman catholic service so they'll use the same church but they'll have it after no use going to roman catholic church and trying to sort of socialize because it is very much uh, an introspective type moment and for sort of local people they won't be looking to make new friends but if you go to the sort of expat protestant service afterwards they sometimes have a little sort of um i don't know uh, uh, tea afterwards or whatever and they and then, uh, meet new members and so on so that's another um thing to do and then coming back to tracy's point um um courses held or promoted by the local council in portugal the language one is actually completely free and you have um local councils will put on a free language course and and that's one of the disadvantages of portugal most people say is that portuguese is so much more difficult to learn than spanish and slightly more difficult than than french although they're all romantic or romantic depending on your your, your perspective languages so they're all latin based but the councils have free usually free lessons um, for people um, who've moved into the area and don't speak Portuguese. And you can go along and meet other people from other countries at at, uh, at those free uh, language sessions. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Lewis. And uh, is Joanne, if, uh, if I could just ask you to add any, any points you make, I'm sure that it's all relatively similar in Spain from my experience. It is. It's very similar. Um, Definitely the points about the town halls and their local language courses. Um, speaking from experience from my parents, when they moved over here, they now have a core friend group. Um, they're just shocking with each other. They really are. <laughs> they're like teenagers. Actually, they they're friends with Emma's parents <laughs> as well. Um, they all met on the local language group and there's a group of about 12 of them now who regularly go out for lunch and they actually play petanque, which is the, the bowls um between between them as well so that's really got them out and about and in, integrated into the society what i would say is that there is definitely no one size fits all and you do have to be very very honest with yourselves when you're transplanting your life from one country to another about the things that make you tick what makes you work and what do you like doing and if it's i don't know wine tasting or stargazing or dog walking or whatever it is you will find a group that will accommodate those things over here as well now what of, one of the biggest things um louise briefly touched on it for, with the americans but certainly in this area it's also huge with the uk um expats is the facebook groups there are facebook groups for everything over here and finding out that that niche for you and jumping on those groups will get you involved but one of the other really important things to do is don't underestimate the help that a relocation agent like ourselves can bring to you. It is part of our job to make sure that you're choosing the right area and make sure that in that area, it will accommodate your likes and your wishes. And one of our things that we have to do, or we should be doing, is making sure that we're introducing you to other people who've already moved over here, different groups and societies that you can join into to facilitate your move over. A big group in this area and all around the world, but certainly in this area, it's massive, is one called the U3A, which is the University of the Third Age. And they are filled with expats from all over the world in the local areas, um, lots of Brits, lots of uh, English speaking uh, customers. So we've got Canadians, Americans, South Africans, Australians, and then there's lots of Dutch and Norwegians and Belgians as well in these groups. And there are subgroups within 
under the umbrella of the U3A and they are just fantastic to join. It's about 12 euros a year to join. And then there's lots of different clubs and societies that you can join within that. And they are a fantastic tool for getting involved. And then the other thing that I will definitely say to everybody is from my own perspective, um, I'm part of a ladies group over here, which is raucous. We go out for lunches all the time. We raise money for charity. And that's a fabulous way of getting involved in the local society. And things like that lead through into other things. So Spain has got so many cultures and traditions and fiestas that go on. And through being part of ladies groups and things like that, we're now part of the fiestas commission. So we get dressed up and walk down the streets and things like that. So there's lots of different things that you can get involved in, but not one size fits all. If you're quite introverted, there's going to be groups and societies that will help you get involved in a more sedate way as well. You don't have to be over, over, over the top. Okay, thanks, Joanne. Um, just to sort of reflect on the comment about paddle, I would say that um, you know a lot of friends of mine uh, in Spain had uh, got involved with paddle and indeed in seven side football and things like that, uh, golf, etc. Uh, paddle, interestingly, uh, most of the friends we came were in their sort of forties and so on and played a lot, but they played a lot of people in their seventies and so on. It's a it's a game that you know people who are less mobile, shall we say, can play. I mean, my personally, I'm too fat and old to do it, but um, others have uh, have have continued. Um, and uh, and the other thing is that you know over many years of uh, moving abroad and time and again, uh, you know the the school gate is definitely one of the great places to meet people. Uh, but as you get older, that becomes uh, more difficult, and so you do have to make that effort to um, to sort of get out there. Um, okay, so I think um, there are other issues like. Um, you know uh, what you relocate how you relate what you bring and so on uh, but let's move on now to um the immigration side um for those of you who are planning to um sort of have a holiday home spend part of the year there not become full full residents then obviously you're subject now to the one uh, 90 and 180 day rule um many people get a little confused about this but essentially when you come uh, to Europe now, uh, 90 days you can spend in every 180 days. It doesn't mean you've got to spend 90 days and then go away. You can do, spend five days, five days, 10 days, etc. What it means is that you have to look back 180 days at any one point, And in that previous 180 days, you cannot have spent more than 90 days there. Now, at the moment, um, you know, you, you might get away with overstaying, but increasingly they are picking up on on people moving, and there are new uh, regulations about uh, uh, whatever you call it, um, the biometric uh, testing and so on, and and that will mean that they will be um, much tighter on it over over the coming months. And that date has moved. Um, I don't know the the current date. I believe it's later this year, um, but those sort of things are there. But essentially. That 1980 days has caused its problems for many people. You have to remember, however, that fundamentally it's not different to pre-Brexit because what you have, if if you stay more than 183 days in a year, then you become tax resident in the country. So therefore, you've always been restricted to, if you like, to half the time. And if you go over, you would become tax liable. Um, and now what it is, is it's 1980 days, which obviously is more restrictive if you want to spend the entire summer there or anything like that. So uh, that is an issue. But for the majority of you, uh, you've indicated that you're planning to go uh, long term, uh, you know, full time uh, retired to Spain. Uh, obviously, trips back to the UK, I'm not saying full time, full time, but, uh, you know, becoming fully resident. And in that case, you, you need to get a visa. And the visa will vary from country to country. And we will go down into more detail in the individual country sessions. But perhaps if we could just get a, a bit of an overview on that um, from each of you. Um, perhaps, um, Lewis, would you like to start off there? Yeah, sure. So um, a, a number of visas, but I'm going on the assumption that most people are not coming to Portugal to work. <laughs> nor would I recommend them to come to Portugal to work, to be fair, um, because um, it's bureaucratic and there are not that many work opportunities. So on the assumption that you're coming uh, to, um, to, to live and you're basically going to have some sort of passive income like a pension, <clears throat> excuse me, then there are two primary residency routes. One is to 
apply for a passive income based visa which is the d7 d for dog or delta 7 and that's the most common a visa at the moment and that's the one that has been that we've been saying for years is likely to to become the leading way of people coming into the market and it is it's the equivalent of the nlv the non-lucrative visa in spain but with one big difference or two big differences one is a lot cheaper it's about double the the minimum wage um <clears throat> national wage thing uh, which is about 700 and something so you need about 14 1500 euros uh, per month to um as income to to qualify um <clears throat> and then it allows you to work as well so and if you couple that to a tax status you can actually get a low tax status on certain sources of income including any work generated in portugal which is capped at 20 percent um um at uh, maximum tax so so very advantageous so the d7 the beauty about this visa is it it um uh, you can qualify for it using rented accommodation or you can buy your your home and your property and something to live in or you can even get um what they call a term de responsabilidad which is you can get a family to write and say or family or friends and say to you that they are hosting you for a year you know if they have space in their house so so there are different there are different um ways of doing that the other one is the much talked about a golden visa so um the golden visa is also a residency visa um it typically is not for people who actually want to spend much time in the country simply because one of its advantages is that you don't have to spend the time in the country to get the residency you you the low the low stay requirement so I'm not going to go talk about about the golden visa because of the fact that I'm assuming that this audience of people who are looking for a lifestyle change and therefore actually looking to physically move in the main lock stock and barrel or spend the majority of their time um in 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 overseas countries. Um there is a new visa coming along <clears throat> so to talk to an audience if there are some of you are not retired yet there is a new visa coming along the digital nomad visa the income requirements are a lot higher so 2800 euros on average per person per month as opposed to so it's about double um the the uh, the d7 and but what we're finding where this is important is those people who were getting in um on non-passive income in the past because it wasn't a digital nomad visa so they were getting in on non-passive income so they were working for example and then submitting the application to the Portuguese consulate in Manchester or London uh, and saying well I'm working but I've got income the Portuguese government was accepting that in lieu of passive income no longer now they're saying to you no 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 if you're actually working and your income is not passive you've got to go to the digital nomad visa with a higher threshold so they've closed that loophole around the passive non-passive income um route in the main and i mean just just as a word of caution whenever you hear us speaking and i speak for portugal probably the other countries are similar we'll give you a broad answer and there are 101 exceptions to the answer we might give because you know this you can speak to four experts in the country and get five answers you know so so it, it, it's you know it's worth your while speaking to a few people so that you can actually get a sort of balanced um opinion so anything we say and i uh, ladies i i, I uh, you know without wanting to put words in your mouth but but i think you know just just it's not a hard and fast rule there are always new answers in countries that that mean that you have to sort of double check that but that's um a general approach and that i would say d7 is the one that you want to be looking at for most people in this audience rent or buy um <clears throat> no limitations of where you can rent no buy or buy um quite low thresholds and there's no difference in anywhere um, in terms of whether the Portuguese mainland or the islands, Madeira, the Azores, whatever, they all apply the same rules. So there's no sort of regional variation. Okay, thanks, Lewis. Um, Tracy, perhaps to, if you could explain the uh, outline of uh, rules in, in, in Spain, in, in France, sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so I won't go into great detail because I know on Friday morning we have a France session. So anybody who's interested in knowing more details or has questions on immigration to France, then do join us on Friday morning, because uh, I'm conscious of the time, how it is moving forward, and there's lots to say. So um, much similar to Louis, there is probably for the audience here today, 
for retirees or early retirees, then the long stay visitors visa is a year a year visa for people who move in to France and do not wish to work. But there are, of course, other options for people. And a lot of my clients are younger families um, who are moving across and are also requesting business visas and liberal visas. So that is a subject we can discuss more on Friday. So for this audience, the long stay visitors visa would possibly be the option because it's a non-working visa and it's more attainable because of the fact it's a non-working visa. That does not mean to say that there aren't criteria and um, certain things that you need to meet. It's, France is not the easiest place from an immigration perspective, that is for sure. Um, but if you meet the criteria, then generally speaking, it goes relatively smoothly, especially for the non-working visas. The long stay visitors visa, like most immigration procedures and like most persons in France, you kind of have to tick off four major boxes, i.e. who you are, so proof of ID, who you are, um, so birth, birth certificates and things like that, where you're going to be living. So this brings up the point of rental or purchase. You have to be able to prove that during the year that you request your visitor's visa where you'll be living. So that could be rental or purchase accommodation. Of course, purchase shows investment in France and therefore um, is a good uh, thing to show. Rental accommodation is accepted, but it has to cover the duration. So rental contracts of a yearly basis or a six month renewable um, is important to show. But again, uh, uh, much similar to other people, the difficulty of get rental accommodation on a long term basis can be complicated. Um, then you have to kind of show uh, your financial situation. You have to meet the financial criteria. And of course, as retirees or early retirees, it could be pensions, as in uh, health, health, um, sorry, uh, state pensions if you're a retirement age. But it could also be private pension pots that you are using for your retirement. So we can work on a um, lots of different um, proofs. So it's all about showing the evidence of how you are going to be sustaining your life in France. Um, and they will take into account whether you've paid for your property up front, so you have no mortgage. If you have a mortgage, that would be, have to be taken into account. So they look at your bank statements from the UK, at least minimum three months bank statements, obviously savings accounts, and to show how you are going to sustain your lifestyle in France. Um, the um, very much agree what Louis says about the whole financial criteria in France. It, there is... The SMIC is the minimum earnings level. So, of course, a lot of it is based around the SMIC, which is 1,000, approximately 1,600 um, euros net per month. Um, but we can't just use that because there are other criteria to take into account. So it is a very much based on a case by case basis and how um, your file is perceived. So if you don't meet the financial criteria, it doesn't mean you won't necessarily get through. And if you do meet it, it doesn't necessarily mean you get through. You have to show the whole evidence of that. And the final factor would be healthcare. So if you move into France, of course, uh, on a long stay visitor's visa, you have uh, two options. One would be private healthcare for your first year in France. So you prove that you're not a burden on the French healthcare service for your first year. And, um, and once you are in France, then, of course, you're applied to the French healthcare service. The second option would be, of course, the S1. If you are of pensionable age receiving state pension, you can request an S1 from the Department of Health and Pensions. And even if you don't actually have in your hand the S1, but you have proof that it's under process, then that email is uh, sufficient to avoid taking private healthcare out. So if you go to your visa meeting with proof that your S1 is underway, you won't need to have private health care insurance. But if you have not, you don't have that, then you will need private health care insurance for the first year. So they're the four key areas for a long stay visitor visa. But as I said, you know, our job as handholders, relocation specialists, all of us here on the table, is about taking you through all of those steps and making sure that you have the best file possible no matter what, which visa you're going for. Um, and so it's difficult, as we said as well, to say exactly uh, the, the one thing you can tick off because there's quite a lot of different information that you need to, to be aware of. So that's it in a nutshell. Okay, thanks, Tracy. Um, and finally, Joanne, um, if you could uh, outline the, uh, the requirements in Spain. Not a problem. Um, very similar to both Portugal and France. Um, Post-Brexit, for our UK uh, viewers, 
things have become considerably considerably more difficult to get the visas to come and stay and live in Spain. However, in a nutshell, um, when you have someone on your side that knows the processes, we can make it a hell of a lot more uh, smooth, possibly even a little bit enjoyable um, <laughs> by organizing it, things for you. And if it's not enjoyable, there's a carver at the end of it anyway to wash it all down with, wash the sorrows away. So it's not so bad, but in a nutshell, the things that you need to do in order to make sure that you will be able to get the, um, the, the visa that you're after is you're going to need a criminal record check. OK, in the UK, that's called an ACRO report and you go, you're going to have to get that. Um, it doesn't matter if you do have a little bit of a past, uh, you were a little bit naughty when you were younger or something. Don't panic too much. Um, we need to know what it is. We need to see it. And then we'll be able to give you a definitive yay or nay as to whether it's worth proceeding with the application. You're also going to need to prove that you are not going to be a burden on the Spanish state. That, be, that means both financially and healthily. Financially, this means that you need to meet the IPREM, it's called over here, which is the minimum base rate. And over here, that's set at 28,800 euros per annum for the first applicants in a family. Every subsequent family applicant after that is 7,200 euros per annum. Okay, so all that adds up. That doesn't mean that you have to have that coming in in passive income. And passive income means money that you're not actively going out and earning. So like a wage, uh, so like a pension, or if you have a rental property and you have rental income coming in, that's passive income. If you're going out working, that's not passive income and that will not be acceptable. You won't be able to get what's the, the visa I'm specifically talking about here, which is the non-lucrative visa. Um, so we need to have a look at your finances where if you've got savings and things like that, that will all go towards that. So it's it's very easy to obtain. We just need to we just need to be open with each other. We need to know what situation you're in and then we can guide you in the right way and make sure that you're going down the right path to get the right visa, which is going to work for you when you want to come and move to Spain. Um, but yeah, the two most important things are the ACRO report, the, the criminal record report and the, um, the financial situation. Then you've got your healthcare, which again, um, Tracy touched on the S1 form for our retirees. If you're a UK state pensioner, then you will have the right to a pension for life. And that is also your healthcare for life. Now, if you have that healthcare for life, you will be issued a certificate from the Department of Work and Pensions. And that certificate is called the S1. That S1 form is handed in to the Spanish government or the Spanish Immigration Office. They will pass it through to Social Security over here. And ergo, you are now able to get healthcare in Spain and it's paid for by the UK government. That S1 form is your golden ticket. If you don't qualify for an S1 form, then you will have to have private health insurance. Now, for our UK uh, customers, that can often be quite, <gasps> oh my word, for our American customers, it's a drop in the park compared to what you've been paying in private health care. So <laughs> everything's relative, <laughs> okay. Um, and then once you've got your health care, then the other thing is if you have any uh, minors that are coming in on your um, applications, then they will need birth certificates as well to prove that they are who they are. Uh, we also need to make sure very, very important that you are not an illegal immigrant. So if you are in a state of, it's called an irregular state in Spain. So this is where we go back to the 90 days in 180 that Nigel was talking about before. If you have overstayed on your tourist visa or on your allowance into the Schengen zone, you will be denied access or you will be denied your visa. So it's very important when you're traveling in and out of Schengen that you get your stamps in the passport that show when you entered and when you left. Very, very important because they will go through this with a fine tooth comb. And we have had numerous counts of people being denied because they have overstayed. We've also had counts of people, and this is very important as well, once you have your residency and you're here for a year, when it comes to renewal, if you haven't maintained your residency status, because in Spain, a non-lucrative visa means a residency visa. That means you're declaring taxes, doing tax returns. You have to be here for over 183 days a year. If your stamps in your visas, if that happens, in your stamps in your password, if that happens, and you have enough, you don't have the stamps in your passport to prove that you, or if, I'm getting it explained. If you have a stamp in your passport that shows you've left the country, and you didn't use your residency card to show that you shouldn't have had that stamp, 
and then you don't have an internal stamp coming in, coming back in, they'll deny your visa. So you have to be very, very careful over here to make sure that you're following the criteria to a T. We will keep you on the straight and narrow 100%, but there are so many things that we need to be aware of. And as the guys said before, you can ask one question and get five different answers from four different people. It's so, so individual to each of your individual statuses. So it's so important to have that one on one time to sit down and talk about your individual status so we can run through exactly what you need to do and what you need to have in order to make sure that you get your renewal or you get your visa and the subsequent renewals afterwards. Okay, thanks, Joanne. Um, just a quick comment, a comment on the S1. Um, uh, one thing to bear in mind is that it can take a while to get that come through. I speak from personal experience. It took me several months of uh, toing and throwing, and also for the pension, it took me uh, several months. And when I rang up to say, where is it? They, they said, oh, nothing seems to have happened. And they then sorted it out in a week. But, you know, you have to actively follow these things up. And the S1, first of all, takes some time to arrive. And then once you've arrived, you've got to register it. In, in in spain so so do plan in advance as well work with us that's why you work with us you don't have <laughs> yes well i'm foolish i dealt with it on myself um, uh, and so let's uh, move on to um to healthcare first of all that s1 uh essentially as i think it's already been explained in the context of uh, the uh, the visa an S1 basically is a form that confirms that you're entitled to health care in that foreign country paid for by the UK government. So as a result of that, you get healthcare in the country through the state paid for by the UK government. It also means that you can get healthcare when you go back to the UK, uh, but um, if you don't have an S1, when you go back to the UK, you are not entitled to use the National Health Service for free once you become resident in another country. So um, that's the first thing, but the, the key thing is, you know, do you need private health care or can you get into the state health care when you get there? And perhaps if we could go uh, one at a time there. Um, Tracy, could you start off by uh, explaining what happens on health care in, 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 in France? Yeah, uh, health care, again, is a huge subject, um, an important one. Um, what I would firstly like to point out for the health care in France is it's a completely different system to the UK system. Um, it is not a free service. Everybody contributes in some way or form to the healthcare system, unless you have the S1 retirement form where you won't pay social contributions into the healthcare system. So um, the access to the French healthcare system, I would say, comes in four different ways. One is if you are a salaried person working in a French company. Another is if you're a business owner of any type in France. The third one would be, of course, if you are retired in receipt of retirement pension and of retirement age. And the fourth category would be for anybody who doesn't fall in the other categories, then we have to work them through a residency criteria. So if you've been living in France for three months or more and can prove it, then you have access to the French healthcare system, although it's a little bit more of a complicated process. Um, so for this particular situation here for people who move to France as retirees, using the long stay visitors visa that we just talked about previously, then once they've moved to France and they've been living in France for three months or more and can prove it, they can apply to the French healthcare service called the CPAM. Um, and their access gives them exactly the same rights as a French person. If they have an S1, it's the same thing they have to apply. It's just the documents that would change. Each situation uh, implies certain documentation. It will always be proof of who you are, proof of where you live, proof of financial status, and of course, what your current healthcare situation is. Are you on private healthcare or are you with the S1? Um, the process itself takes about, I would say, I'd like to say three to six months uh, to get into the healthcare service. Um, what is important to remember is it's the getting the social security number that counts in France. That is what gives you access to healthcare reimbursement of your healthcare up to about 70%, depending which doctor or specialist you are seeing, it's 70% of the French healthcare rate that you will get once you have a social security number, which can take about three months to get. The carte vitale, which is the, the famous green card, 
if people know of the capital in France, is what gives you, um, is what facilitates the reinvestment system, if you like. It allows you to avoid the paperwork process of getting reimbursed. It's a card that you hand over to your doctor. So as a general example, you will always pay for your health care up front when you're in front of the GP or uh, your local practitioner. You will pay up front for your consultation and get reimbursed into your bank account, either through sending off your paperwork because you haven't yet got a carte vitale, uh, you've only got the social security number, or because you have the carte vitale, you get reimbursed within two, three business days directly into your bank account. So I think... Um, in a subject that is so large, what is important to take away in this call today is that the healthcare system is different. It's a very good system. And because of that, it get you people pay into it. Um, and uh, the first objective, when you've done through your visa process, you've arrived in France, you're settled in your house, the very next process you should work on is your healthcare, because it can take a minimum of six months, I would say. And if you're on a private healthcare coverage because you've come through a visa process, when you go for your renewal of that, the, that uh, residency card, when you go for the renewal, you have to prove your healthcare again. And if you don't want to have to go through private healthcare, you have to show that you're going to the French healthcare system. So I would say it's the number two priority once you've moved into France after your immigration process would be your healthcare process. Um, so I'm not sure if that's enough or not enough, but I don't want to take up too much time. <laughs> okay, thanks, Tracy. Um, I've got a question here from uh, Andrew in the audience. Um, and I, I just want to make sure that, you know, what you've said has already answered this question, but it's S1 in France. Do we have to wait until it's registered before we get health care benefits, or will we still need full private insurance to cover us for that period? Or will the S1 with the mutual insurance suffice? Okay, so yeah, very good question. So if you have access to the S1 to move out of France, the S1 has to be registered once you are in France before you will get any coverage via the health healthcare system. Once you have um, sent off your S1 and they're in receipt of it, any, any, any uh, healthcare costs will be um, paid backdated. So you might not get reimbursed straight away, but once all the paperwork have gone through, it will be backdated. But it's not when you move into France with an S1 that you're covered. It's from the moment the healthcare service, the, the CPAM has received the documents. That's when your healthcare starts from, uh, from a um, paperwork perspective. What you can do in that interim period, because you don't necessarily have to get private healthcare because you've got the S1, is you can use your GIT card. So you can use your UK GHICAS, it's now called not EHIC card. Um, if you're not sure if you're quite in the system yet, just use your GHIC card, get reimbursements from the UK whilst you've sent off your S1. Once they've received your S1, in the meantime, keep all your receipts when you go to the doctors in France. And then once you've received your social security number, you can send them all off to get your uh, reimbursements. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Joanne, could you uh, just sort of outline um the healthcare arrangements in, in Spain. I'm going to let Emma ask, uh, answer Hello. this one. <laughs> Emma processes all of our um, healthcare requirements within the office, so she's the perfect expert for this. I'm going to uh, answer this one. Yeah. Basically, for Spanish immigration, we actually have to register the S1 before we're at the consulate. So when you go to the consulate, I have to show a piece of paper that says that the S1 has been registered with the Spanish healthcare. Okay, so I register that prior to the application. Once that visa is in the passport, I can then finalize that registration. So literally within days of arriving in Spain, your S1 is complete and you have Spanish healthcare, for the, the full comprehensive healthcare. If you go with a private health insurance, that has to be live and active the same time as your visa. So your visa, and your private healthcare is run simultaneously. Yeah. So it's all done at the same time as your visa process. Mm -hmm. Otherwise they won't. Otherwise they won't accept the, the, the visa application for Spain. Okay. Okay. And and so in terms of getting access to the um in terms of getting access to the healthcare in Spain, if you don't have an S1. Prior to, because I mean, my problem like, when I arrived, I was on, I was not a pensionable age, so I was uh, looking to do that in preparation. What, what about those sort of people? 
Well, people that uh, are not pensionable age would have to take out private healthcare insurance. If they're coming from the UK, for example, when they go to the consulate, there's a certificate the insurance company has to, to issue that says that they've taken out comprehensive healthcare insurance and that it runs from a set date. And that set date is the same date as the visa date. Okay. Um, and then the other option is when people are in Spain and they've lived in Spain for over a year, we can um, apply for the convenio especial. And the convenio especial is when you pay into the healthcare system in Spain and you receive just the healthcare basis, no pensions or anything like that. You're just paying into the healthcare in Spain. And those are the options for Spain. It's also important to note that when people are going for the private healthcare option, that that policy must be all encompassing. Mm -hmm. There are no co-payments, no excesses, no disqualifications or exclusions. Mm -hmm. It has to be 100% coverable, i.e. the same as an NHS policy so that they will never turn you away if you go to the door of A&E. So that it's very, very important to understand that you many people will come to us saying that they've been, they're buying a house over here and they've been offered health care through their bank or something like that. Steer clear, steer clear, because those policies invariably have something in there that will not allow you to get residency, even though they will tell you it's a residency policy, it will be turned away. So before you sign for any type of health insurance, please sit down with us and run through that with us because we need to make sure it's going to be accepted. They will turn you down on, on health insurance policies. Right. Okay, let's uh, move on to driving. One of the joys I will speak from personal experience in uh, Spain driving is that people go on roundabouts in a rather different way in Spain. Um, they are taught to go around until they come to their exit. So it's not that they're bad drivers, it's the fact that that's the way they go. So as a Brit who is used to sort of doing it, going in the inside lane and then going on the outside lane, you can suddenly find a car cutting across you. So things are not always the same. Um, one of the great things though is that, and uh, I would just ask a confirmation from the others, is that the driving insurance the um, is actually, car insurance is, for the car and not for the individual. So anybody can drive your car if they um, they have your permission and so on and will be covered. So um, Tracy, uh, is, does that uh, does that same apply in in Spain in France? Sorry? Yes, if anybody had anybody who has um, their own insurance policy, obviously. Yeah. If when insurance policy and they have a clean driving license, they can drive your car, yes. So they have to have their own policy, so they can't drive on your policy? Well, if they're mentioned on your policy, if they're okay. mentioned as a driver, they can. But if, if they're not mentioned on your, on your policy, but they have their own insurance for their own car, then they can drive your car because they'd be covered under the insurance. Okay, so so that's the difference between Spain and France, uh, because yeah. as I say, to be clear, in in Spain, the insurance policy that I hold means that Joanne can drive my car without whether she's insured or not. It doesn't matter. She drives under my insurance policy, and anybody driving is covered. Um, there are there is an exception to that, though. Sorry, Nigel, <clears throat> just to, for clarity, that is very specific to certain policies. Certain policies don't allow that. And all policies, if you're under 25, will not allow that. If you're under 25, you have to be a named driver. Now you can phone them the day before. My, I do it all the time when my nephew comes out. It costs me about 30, 30 euros to put him on the policy for the two weeks that he's over here and then he can drive my car. It's cheaper by a country mile than what I'm hearing comes out of the UK. Um, but yeah, by and large, in Spain, well. the policies are yeah. that you insure the vehicle, anybody can drive that vehicle as long as they have the vehicle owner's permission. And that, that's verbal permission, it's not written permission. So if you get pulled over, the polythea will call and say, such and such is driving your car. But if that person is under 25, they do need to be on the policy. Okay. And, and Lewis, sort of, how does it work in, in Portugal? Yeah, I was just actually going to make a comment about um, Joanne's point. Actually, when our son comes over, for example, to the UK, um, we do exactly the same thing. We put him on the policies so that he can drive. So, so, so there's this kind of. I think there is a general approach in terms of policy name drivers and then additional drivers and 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 so on. Um, 
Uh, Nigel, I admit I'm totally confused now. <laughs> um, we have different we have different things. So we have um, in Portugal we have um, the policy which is um, uh, relating to the vehicle, okay, um, as such, right? So you can you can you insure insure the vehicle, um, and then uh, and then people can drive uh, the vehicle. The problem is, as Tracy and, um, and Joanne have pointed out. Um, there are exceptions depending on who else and what age they are um, in, in in terms of driving. So, um, and that changed. I can't remember the ages anymore. But what I would say is that is not usually the question that we get. We get the thing about, okay, the driver's license. What do I do with my driver's license yeah. when I All get right. to... To the, so 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 um, yeah. I've come I've come to 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 Portugal or Spain or whatever, and I now need to um, um, exchange my driver's license. So the interesting thing about Portugal is that if you are not resident, um, and forgive me because I'm not a driving expert, so I may have my date slightly wrong here, but I think you can you can drive actually for about 180 days in the year um, if you're a non-resident, right? But if you are a resident. You can only do that for 90 days before you have to actually formally register. It's kind of the, a strange way around, but um, I assume this is because you can then come various times and visit in a year and you can whatever. So I don't know the reason why we have experts to deal with driving driver licenses. But the general rule is if you have a driver's license and you want to exchange you have to do that within a predetermined period. But if you are at a certain age, you also have to do additional tests, eyesight tests, okay? And those eyesight tests have to be done by a doctor and the eyesight tests have to be registered with the, what we call the EMTT, which is the body that uh, controls the driving licenses so that they can check that you are uh, eligible to drive in terms of your eyesight. And then, and again, I can't remember, so forgive me, but there's a periodicity. So up to 50, your driver's license is valid until, you know, 50. After 50, you have to take this, this, this eyesight test, I think once every five years, or maybe it's 10. And then after 65, it's five years. And then after 73, whatever. So there is a decreasing periodicity in terms of uh, uh, it's a bit like the UK. So in the UK, you have to do the same thing to 75 years. Uh, your, I think it's 75 or 70. I can't remember. Your driver's license is valid. And then you have to renew every um, um, three or five years in the UK. Again, I can't remember. Okay, okay. So similar process. So the first thing is exchanging driver's license. Make sure you're within the time frames. This is the key thing. Otherwise, you will have to do the test again. And you'll have to do it in the local language. And you'll have to do your theory and your practical driving test. And trust me, you'll have to give up driving because you, will, you probably won't want to, want to go through that, that um, hassle. The other thing is that um, you were mentioning the roundabouts and so on. Even when you exchange a license, and this has happened to me because I drive, uh, for example, when I'm in Portugal, I have my UK car, which I have in Portugal, so I'm driving on the wrong side of the road. Well, not the wrong side of the road, but the steering wheel's on the wrong side, okay? It is, I'm accustomed to it, but most people find it unusual, if not unnerving, okay? Um, because you're overtaking, you're having to take stuff out of toll booths, you know, when you drive, when you're on the other side of the car. So the car importation thing is the other thing that a lot of people talk about. And I would, I would, let's say, counsel strongly and think people to think strongly about whether they want to take a car over from a place like the UK to a place like France, Spain, or Portugal for a whole range of reasons, not least of which because as we age, we became a bit more perhaps erratic in our driving, you know, hitting more pavements, hitting more things, you know, <laughs> and things like that. And therefore, and therefore you, you have to take care that you're not putting yourself and others at risk by increasing sort of the degree of risk of sort of not looking on, 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 on the right side or driving on the correct side of the road. Okay. So just. Lewis, thank you very much. Um, I think Tracy um, has a appointment. We need, we need to leave us very shortly. So Tracy, if you could, um, 
just give us an outline on the um, the driving license, the rules, and the uh, and, and importation of, of cars in, in France. Yes, sorry, yes, I do have to leave you in a few minutes because I I have another important meeting coming up, so I apologize for that. But yes, yeah, so from a driving license perspective, um, very similar, uh, you would need to exchange that within the first year of living, within the first year of your first visa or cut social. Um, since Brexit, um, the rules are that if your driving license has been um, renewed um, after the 1st of January 2023, 2022. I'm even forgetting the dates of the Brexit now. So uh, if it was uh, the end of the transition period, it was the 1st of January 2021. Um, sorry, it's passing so quickly the time. So if your driving license was renewed or created after that date, then you would have to exchange it within the first year of living in France. If um, it was before the end of the transition date, then you can keep it and use it in France as a valid driving license until it is lost, stolen, expired, or you've committed a driving infraction that would take points off your license. So it's not too bad. So it's a question of looking at your driving license and see when it was issued. Um, so that's the driving license. From a car registration perspective, you're bringing a car over from a non-European country, like the UK is, then you need to be very careful to make sure it goes through the customs process. Make sure you get what's called an A846 document because that will allow you to register your car in France without paying customs duties of 10% and VAT of 20%. I certainly advise my clients who are relocating with us to either not to bring the cars across from a registration perspective. I mean, there's nothing to stop them driving across and keeping it for a few months, but then getting rid of it back in the UK or in France. But registering a, a non-EU car in France can be very expensive. It is not a cheap option because you will have costs for the registration. And of course, the transportation, uh, it'd have to be on your transporters list to come through because they open up a T1 document as you come through the customs. So there's all of that um, process that you have to go through, which is not one of the easiest. So if you are bringing a vehicle or more than one vehicles, either speak with your transport who you're coming across from the UK to France with to make sure it's on the inventory list to bring across with you. So you get this famous A846 documents. And once you have that, the registration is done online via the ANTS system, most things are done online now. Um, this is the process that is done online. And one of the documents they will ask you for is the customs document to prove that it's fiscally okay to bring the car across, along with, of course, many of the documents, which I won't actually tell now, but generally speaking, you know, the documents you need to prove that you have a driving license and things like that. So um, driving license, car registration. I, I generally say, if you haven't got a car that you're emotionally attached to, leave it and just buy one in the country that you live in. Otherwise, as Louise said at the beginning of the webinar, you'll be leaning out the windows for your parking and you'll be, you know, running outside the car to go through the tolls and stuff. It's just not worth the hassle. So um, unless you've got any other questions that are important for me, Nigel. No, then... that's, and thank you very much, Tracy. I, I think uh, we don't have any specific questions related to France. And uh, obviously, we will be dealing with them in the individual country session. So we'll go into more detail at that point. Exactly. Thank, so thank I you, will Tracy. see you on the next one. I will definitely be here on Friday. Thanks. Lovely to meet you, Louise. And thanks, Joanne. Nice to see you both. OK, take care. Right. Bye bye. Uh, and so finally, Joanne, I mean, obviously, in, in Spain, um, we've had enormous trouble in terms of driving licenses. Uh, negotiations have, uh, have continued. Perhaps you could explain the current requirements for people of what they need to do. Yeah, um, currently we're in limbo land. <laughs> Simple as that, basically. Um, Spain and England, or the UK, sorry, have not come to an agreement with regards to the exchange of driving licenses yet. That saying, they actually we know they have now come to an agreement regarding driving licenses it has not yet been ratified nor passed through the um the state tribune so basically we're on the edge of a precipice um legally over here if you are driving on a uk license and you are a resident of spain then you should not be driving 
you should be taking the bus, you should be taking taxis, uh, trains, whatever, you shouldn't be driving. However, there is a bit of leniency towards this. There seems to be a bit of a, um, a moratorium on the police pulling people over and checking for the licenses um, because everybody knows the situation that we're in. We expect that the agreement with regards to license exchange will drop in any week now. Um, I mean, I can, we have a list as long as our arm of, of, of clients that we have over here waiting to get that exchange done. Um, as soon as it's done, it's the same as the other countries. We just need to transfer the license over. Basically, in the EU, the law is that if you are a resident of any EU member state, then any documentation, ID documentation, including licenses, needs to be issued from that member state. So that includes the driving license. So, yeah, as soon as that's passed through, we'll be processing those for everybody. Um, we did find it was a bit of an off putter for many people thinking of moving to Spain. Um, funnily enough, the driving license was the thing that was stopping people doing it because they were petrified of doing the um, the, the test, etc. We have had quite a few of our clients do the test over here and actually thought it wasn't too bad in the end. So it's all that perceived fear about it rather than the actual actuality of it. However, that's saying any week now, watch this space it will drop in and the license exchange will happen um with regards to importing cars the same as the other countries uh, sorry, just before just, sorry, just before we leave the driving license it, so most of the people here will be moving at some point in the future hopefully the the group will be in place how long is it from the time you arrive to when you have to you can drive on your uk license is it on your, so once you've come over and once you have residency, you have six months to change it over. Yeah, so, so yeah. people basically have that six months. Yeah, it takes it takes a matter of weeks re in reality to change it over. What causes the delay over here is the printing of the actual licenses. So the applications are put in. You can have the new um, psychometric test, which, like Louise said, it's your eye, it's your eye test. But there's also, if you go back to the 1980s and Atari. There's like an old Atari system that you have to work on with batting balls away to see your hand-eye coordination. Um, it's a very easy test, very easy test. Um, but yeah, that's that's got to be applied for and authorised within six months. And then you wait for your licence to, be, um, to okay. be... Now, bear in mind, sorry, Nigel, but bear in mind, when you do apply to, to change over your licence, there will be a period where you've handed your UK license into the Spanish authorities and you wait for your Spanish license to arrive at your address. That invariably can be between two weeks and eight months. It can be a long time. There is no set time limit. There is no magic wand. There is no way anyone can push that through. So if you are planning on going back to the UK or overseas to hire a car somewhere, delay applying for your application to change your license until you've done that journey because you won't have a physical license and you can't guarantee having that license during that period so bear that in mind because that has caused a bit of a curveball for quite a few people so okay. you're stuck between the law and what you actually want to do with your life okay thanks Joanne. so the importation of cars sorry to interrupt that's fine the importation of cars much like portugal much like france we're for uk citizens oh i should just say as well sorry for all of our uh, customers and, and people watching that aren't from the UK, if you're not within the EU and you're working and you want to come over to Spain to um, drive, you will have to do a test. There's no convenio in place. There's no agreement in place to transfer those licenses over. So you will have to do a test and get an, a license issued in, in Spain. So moving on to importations, importations from outside the EU now are expensive. Um, you will have to pay EVA, which is VAT, on top of it. You have a very small window of opportunity when you get your residency to bring your personal belongings over VAT free. And that's 30 days, one month. Your car can be included in that. So we must make sure that it's a very strict timeline that we have to follow and lots of paperwork. But in all honesty, like the others have said, it's, is it worth it? Car shopping is a fabulous thing. Go and buy a new car when you move over here. Make your new life in Spain, you know, right from word go. Sell your car in the in the UK and bring, or in the US or wherever, and bring 
and buy a new car over here. There's some great deals on leasehold over here as well. So you can lease your vehicle for 200 euros a month and you get everything included, including insurance and wheels and windscreen and everything's included for that price. So sometimes that's the best way to go as well. So there's lots of different options, but with regards to vehicles, again, it's a very personal thing. Just talk to us and we can run through the options. Okay. Now there are many other practicalities of, of moving and uh, you know I think they're best probably dealt with in the individual country uh, sessions. Um, so thank you, Lewis. Thank you, Joanne. And, and obviously, thanks to uh, Tracy. Um, before I leave, just emphasize that, you know, we're here to help, you know, um, and uh, our contribution, if you like, is to provide information on the site and also to sort of uh, refer you to people who we have sort of identified as being uh, able to assist in all the different aspects of um, of moving abroad, whether it's financial, practical, etc. Um, just drop us an email at expats uh, at expat network, sorry, at expats at expat network .com, um, and we can uh, we'll respond as quickly as we can. Um, if there's um, anything, any referrals or whatever, we can we can normally find somebody who can answer your question, even if we can't. Um, and uh, I never try to answer a question that I don't know uh, or I'm not qualified to answer. So uh, clearly, I, I would always refer to people who are qualified to do that. Um, so uh, many thanks, and uh, you know we will be back with more detail on different areas over the over the coming days. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Fabulous. See you Bye. soon. Bye.